welcome to a special episode of Back Pass with Russ. It's special because this one is in collaboration with our friends, the Bola Bola Show, the inspiration behind Back Pass with Russ, I must say. Um, we expected, a, we had planned for a fuller house to be available today, but unfortunately, our friends at the Bola Bola Show were decimated with uh, work commitments, I shall say. And the uh, main man fighting the fort for the Bola Bola Show, Mr. Steven John, is here. How are you doing, Steven? Hey, Russ, I'm doing all fine, good. It's uh, good to collaborate with the Back Pass with Russ. This is our second collaboration, for those of you guys don't know. Yeah, uh, second collaboration, wanna... but third episode. Yes, yes, correct. Maybe you want to take through to the audience, you know, what was our previous collaboration. Yeah, the previous uh, collaboration was on the Euros. So we covered like Euros in the 90s and then second episode was Euros in the 2000s. Uh, so it was quite, quite good and I'm missing your partners, uh, Elvin and Bala. Wish they would be here for the next one. We got one more coming up. One more collaboration coming up after this episode. And uh, in any ways also, um, this episode of course uh, goes out on 31st of August. So I'm wishing all Malaysians a very happy Independence Day, Selamat Hari Kebangsaan to all Malaysians, my beloved Malaysians, my beloved Malaysia also. And the first of all, the affection that I share including, for the country, including Guillermo Di Pola. Stephen, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to say you want to send out your wishes to Malaysians? Well, uh, I mean, it's a it's a good collaboration. In fact, the topic it suits well for the occasion as well. And so I hope uh, all our listeners uh, on the 31st of August, you guys uh, will, will be relaxing at home, uh, spending your time with your family, and do take your uh, your time to listen to this episode and wishing you guys Selamat Hari Merdeka. Yep. And now with us, we've got a special guest. The first time on both our shows, in fact, I would say. You know, he's not appeared on our shows. Uh, he's an author. He's been a journalist as well. It's none other than Mr. Gary Cole, a guy with lots of experience, a lots of knowledge. It'd be it'd be wonderful to speak to you, Gary, on this topic that we're going to speak about today. How are you doing, Gary? Legend well, I'm good. the Cosway, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, my pleasure to meet you, guy Ras Sivan. Good to see you again here this time on Zoom. And actually, yeah. when you spoke about thirty first of August, it's also good. It's a, also a special anniversary for me because it's actually the first anniversary of the book launch of Raw, which is also on my background, Raw Football Legends yeah. of Singapore. Because of that same day last year, we had a football match between the Singapore and Malaysia legends in conjunction with the book launch and also the unveiling of a food sculpture of Singapore's only football Olympian, Chia Boon Leong. So that day is also going to be special for me for a different reason, but also Salamat Hari Kaban Sang, uh, Di Merdeka, Malaysia. Yeah. Pardon my butt. All right. Yeah. All right. No problem. No problem. Thanks. No you problem. tried. You, yeah. you did well, man. And in fact, I've got to say, you know, it's been, uh, what, how many months ago did we meet in person, the three of us? February. It's quite ironic. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's, it's quite ironic. We're back again on an episode now. So it's nice. Um. So let's get the show on the road. So in case you do not know what we're going to speak about, if not read the titles on YouTube or Spotify, the show is going to be about uh, Malaysia, sorry, M League in the 90s. So it's a pretty interesting story and we'll start chronologically. So we'll start with the year 1991. And uh, let me just share my memories of that year. So 1991 is the year I started watching football. So that's when, you know, all this became a supporter of Manchester United, Italy, Inter, Inter, sorry, a bit later, but but especially Manchester United and uh, Italy. And, you know, I was watching football. So one day, I was just watching uh, football. The antenna was out. And uh, grainy images on the screen. I came across this match on TV Tiga. It was um, the Malaysia Cup final. Johor against Selangor, if I'm not mistaken. I, I can't remember who the opponents were. But Johor kept made a quite a big impression on my mind. My young mind at that time, seven years old. Watching that match and... Later in life, I knew that, I found out, sorry, that Abbasad wasn't playing in that final. But for some reason, Abbasad stuck in my mind and he became like my go-to player or the player I, you know, followed. And uh, and yeah, Johor won that final. It was a muddy pitch, I remember. 
raining weather in a uh, KL uh, was a Madeka Stadium as well. So th- that's my memory of that final. Seven and Gary, in fact, for that matter as well. Do you have uh, what do you remember of that final? Well, I'm yeah, Gary, Gary can go first. No problem. Well, unfortunately for 91, I may have to give it a pass because I don't remember much apart from reading from it years afterwards. So, because I only began following football in 94. Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, 1991 was definitely an interesting year because uh, I remember reading in the newspapers at the start of the season, Pahang actually just signed. Uh, they brought back Zainal Abidin. They brought the Dola Saleh. They also signed Fandi Ahmad. I think there was another Singaporean player. I Bohan can't Abusama. really remember. It's Bohan, Bohan Abusama. Abusama, is it? Okay, yeah. yeah. And of I course, think Sundram was also there, right? Hmm, Sundram. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking V Sundram as well, but I'm yeah, not but too Sundram sure. Sundram only half a season there. I think it's Bohan up afterwards, I think. If oh, I'm okay, not. okay, okay. Right. But, so they gave Pang this title called the, the Dream Team because hmm. of the superstars of players. They brought. In fact, the late Shabby was also part of that Pahang team. Yeah, correct, not, correct. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So right, it was a very... It was a Pahang team that I think everybody had a lot of expectation for that year. But mm. surprisingly, I only took the football, Malaysian Football League uh, quite seriously when I moved in sometime in the middle of 91 to Shah Alam. I was staying in Sri Muda. And that's when I realized, you know, how Slango is very big, very huge. Uh, and, you know, all my, most of my classmates, I would say 100%, except for me, 1% only, and they were all rooting for Slango. But unfortunately, in that semi... For? I was not really rooting for any team at that time, but I was kind of hoping Pahang would do something. Lah. Okay, I didn't okay. anticipate that the whole semi-final was going to be a one-sided affair where Slango demolished Pahang 4-0 in Merdeka Stadium and 2-0 in Kuantan. I'm thinking, like, what the hell happened? And, <laughs> you know, that Slango team, of course, you know, so, it, it, I mean, there's a lot of uh, many names. I think Jaya Kanten was one of the Carol Stromsik, quite a few quite a few household names. Lah. And... Mm. Of course, I was hoping that Slango looked like... I mean, I, I mean, not to say hoping. I was kind of feeling that Slango is going to be the favourite for the Malaysia Cup final hmm. because the fact that how they dismantled Pahang that easily, just like that. And hmm. uh, in the other semi-final, that was the most epic battle probably I've seen in the, when it comes to local football at the time between Joho and KL. Uh, hmm. Joho had, of course, Abbas, as you mentioned. They also had this guy called Elvin Boban. And yeah, Edward Edward was Bowen. also part of that team as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, KL, if I'm not mistaken, they had a player called Zora Nikolic. And that game went on all the way to the wire. I think the first leg in uh, JB, Johor won 2-1. Then in the se- second leg in KL, uh, I think KL made a comeback. Scott, I don't know, quite late in the game to force the game into extra time. And I think somewhere along the line, Abbas got sent off. I think he got suspended yeah. or what? I'm not too sure. But definitely he was going to miss he the final. He got sent off, yeah. Okay, all right. So, I think the game's... I think Joe scored an equalizer or something. So, the match finished 2-2 and, you know, they made it to the final. And, of course, you know, on paper, we were thinking uh, Joe without Abbas, I mean, how could they possibly be able to beat Slango? It felt like Slango's title for the taking. But, man, football always has some unexpected twists for us. And as you just mentioned, you know, Joho in the rain in Merdeka Stadium pulled off one of the most magnificent results of the season. But not... But by right, it shouldn't be a surprise because Joe actually even clinched the double that year. They won yeah. the... Uh, it wasn't the Premier League. I think it was still known as a semi-pro league. They semi-pro won the league, division yeah. title. Yeah. And uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, Abbasad was also a top scorer in the league that season. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you spoke about Pahang. Now, Pahang's dream team. I just googled it. In fact, Sundram was playing from 91 to 92 uh, for Pahang. Mm. So that dream team of, of Pahang, would you want to expand on it? Tell us more about that dream team and that, that season after now, after losing that semi-final to Johor, or rather to Slango, getting demolished by Slango, in fact, for that matter. Uh, now, 90, oh. 92 was their season, was their year, right? Yep, 92 was their year, basically. And uh, just to add on a few more names into the lineup, they had this player called uh, Ahmad Yusof. If I'm not mistaken, later on, right. he also became the coach of Pahang. Mm-hmm. They also had a, the goalkeeper, Kairul Azman Muhammad. Yeah, I think at Kairul the time, Azman, the 90s, yeah. was considered one of the, I think was considered the Malaysia's number Iconic one goalkeeper. Goalkeepers. Yeah. Yes. And I'd also got a player called Mubin Mokta. So it was, a, it was a star-studded lineup. I think 92 was probably the year where everything gelled together for Pahang. They, was Alan Davidson there already? 
Yes, Alan Davidson was there already as well. Yeah, oh, he was there. He was class. Yeah, I mean, top one of the top defenders, like basically. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, back then the imports that we signed in the Malaysian League at that time were not, you know, unlike today where you tend to have players who come in half of the season and then get changed out of the half of the season. But back then, when Malaysian teams sign import players, I mean, sort of deviate a bit, but I thought this should be something worth to be highlighted here. Yeah. Yeah. When teams sign import players, we're not talking about any kind of import players. We're talking about quality players, players mm. like Alan Davidson, yeah. players like Scott Lorenzo, Abbas, Alistair, Zoran. You know, a lot of these names. If, if you ask me, they are quality players, top class players, players that I think for were, their national teams as well, right? They some broke of them, into yes. the, like yeah. Australian team, yeah. Yeah, some of them actually even were kept by their national team. In fact, you know, some of them yeah. could have had a, a decent career in Europe. But I think because of the the offer that was given here was quite good that they were willing to come, and many of them, you know, stayed quite. A, I mean, they had a lengthy career in Malaysia. They and quite often when I when we interview them in the Bola Bola show and we ask them about their their memories of Malaysian football, they're always grateful because their career in Malaysia was probably the highlight of their career, coming into a league, playing in front of capacity crowd, traveling to places. Mm. You know, playing mm. in front of the, a huge crowd sometimes can be intimidating. Those those feeling, those moments where you want to live as a football player, and in Malaysia, especially in the Malaysian Football League, they they achieve that dream. So but, coming back to this part, yeah, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, but among the Australian players, I think Alistair Edwards sparked the trend a little by going to Europe after his stint with Selangor, because I remember him featuring for oh. Millwall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, he went to Millwall. If I'm not mistaken, it was exchanged with. Um, David Mitchell coming over uh, the Australia. Over this, yes, yes. To Slango. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, about the Pang team. Well, I mean, I think '92 was a year where everything clicked together. They won the 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 Liga Perdana. I think it was still known as a uh, Daniel Liga Perdana, a Liga Semi Pro, and Semi-pro. also they clinched the the Malaysia Cup by beating Kedah. Uh, one, I think it was a 1-0 in the final. I think the goal was quite early in the game. I can't remember who scored the goals. I think it was within the first 10 to 15 minutes of the game. Not the most memorable yeah. final, but, you know, Pang got it done, finally. They got the job done. And the, so then the dream team lived up to his uh, billing then. As the dream team. Because I remember when they... Uh, I mean, we spoke to Fundy as well. And uh, he was mentioning as well, when they brought all these star players together in the first season, he somehow did not gel. You there? Ah, yes, you there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, somehow the team did not gel and uh, and they struggled in that first season, as you mentioned. And then once the second season came about, they got stuck in and then, as you say, you know, they won the league title. So it's also a lesson that you don't always win with the with all the star names in your squad. We've we've seen this many times in yeah. football, even in Europe. So now yeah. moving from 92 to 93, maybe Gary, you want to share some, do you still, do you have any memories of the 93 uh, league season? Well, 93, I, remember... I, I'll just, I'll just digress a bit. Do you guys remember, or do you keep a collection of sticker books in I those days of Malaysian one. League? Actually, I used to have one in 93, but I'm not sure where I keep it now. Probably it's gone, but there were still some spare stickers that, that stick in one of the cupboards that um, one of them I had include Malik Awab, Singapore, Thibaut Sazban of uh, Kuda. Kuda. Yep. And I think one or two Kelantan players. That's when I also began to know some of the names based on what I look at the sticker album. That was when I first heard of Alan Davidson or even Zainal Abidin Hassan. Dola Saleh, Asman Adan, the Malaysian side. And for the Singapore side, you got all these players. These are the first, this was the first time I had quite, you can say, the start of an extensive uh, approach into football. Although I began to follow it a lot more religiously in 1994 in the peak of their Malaysia Cup campaign. Mm. So that's yeah, I remember in my case, I used to buy the stickers and I used to exchange with my cousin in Seremban. We'll, we'll do it by post, you know. So I'll put some stickers, whatever stickers extras I have. 
that I I've, I've already got the stickers. I'll post it to him. He'll post it back to me. Whatever extras he has, so we had this exchange program going on between us, and uh, yeah. So, but somehow we still never managed to complete the book. But those were quite good memories. Anyways, going back to the '92 final, even I I've googled this. Uh, Pahang won one nil to Kedah against Kedah. The goal was scored by Zul Hamizan Zakaria on in the seventh on the seventh minute of mm, the game. There you go. Yeah. So 1993, of course. For Singapore, I mean, this was the first year I'm I religiously started watching the Malaysian League and Malaysia Cup as well. So Singapore's team had the dream team. Now the dream team was in Singapore. You know, Fandi was back, Abbasad was back. Okay, yeah. I mean, Abbasad is not Singaporean, and but he used to play for Singapore. I think that came because FAS did a major revamp after their relegation from the. Liga Padana into Division 2 so they wanted mm. and the fans were all clamouring for all the big stars to come back because back then there were quite a number of our na- national players who were playing in Malaysia in the Malaysian state teams right yeah all right. so it was in a bit you can say to rally, put all the resources and rally towards that one team and headlining this act was obviously Fandi Ahmad when fans were mm. clamouring for him the same thing that you would get again a few decades later when Fundy was clever to coach for Lions 12 in 2014-15. Hmm. Yeah, so then you had all these guys. So Malik came back, Fundy, Alistair Edwards, Abbasad, Sundram, Bora Abusama. Yeah, so you know all these guys came back. That was the Singapore dream team. But another team overshadowed them. Kada. The Kada team, Sivan. Tell us about the Kedah team. Then I'll share my memory of that final, of the Malaysia Cup final in 93. Okay, I don't really remember much about the Kedah team, but I remember their boss, uh, Ahmad Basri, if I'm not mistaken, All his right. name. Ahmad Basri. He was, yeah, he was very, very instrumental and influential person within uh, in Kedah. So I think he was uh, a, a very important figure like, in really raising the team profile. Um I think one of the, the main players that I can really recall is the goalkeeper, Ahmad Sobri. Uh, one of the mm. main players of the team. Uh, I think... Um, Radhi Madin also. Was playing for them. Radhi Madin, uh, yes. Yeah, Radhi Madin. Correct, okay. correct, correct. Those of you, uh, those of you don't know... Competition nowadays, huh, Steven? Well, <laughs> the newly appointed ex-co for youth and sports in Kedah. Well, he is wow. one of the two ex-footballers elected along with Badro Bakhtia. Yeah. Well, footballers have to plan their career ahead. Huh? After that, <laughs> but after, after it's rare to see yeah. footballers get into the ballot box. Well, okay, I think... That's Radhi a topic Madi for another there. day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think among the players that they had, Peter Nikitin was probably one of them. Tibor Zaban, yes, uh, Gary just mentioned. Right. I think he was one of the players of that team. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't was know. There. Come yep. again? Lim Tiong Kim was there. Yes, that's the name I was about to come to. Yeah, Lim Tiong Kim. I think Tan Cheng Ho, was he there also? Uh, yes, apparently, yep. Ah, correct, see? Mm-hmm. So if you look at it, it's it's a, quite a very a strong Kada team. La. I think they were... I'm not too sure whether they were expected to, to win the double that year, but it, they did. In fact, if you look at the trend that goes on between 91 to 1994, you will have the team that loses the Malaysia Cup final that year, but they end up winning the year later. So you had Joe, they, they, oh, they, yeah. they, you, yeah. had, you had uh, Pahang defeating Kedah, then you had Kedah beating Singapore, and let's keep the rest as a show. Actually, on. That yeah. art- there was actually one related article I read back in 94 Kickoff Magazine. I think this was in July where they talk about this particular unique trend the League and Cup double, and that's what you said the losing team in the previous Cup final winning the the cup final, the cup the next year. There was such an article that existed then. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me, that's this one Kada player you've both not mentioned. It's quite an iconic defender, Olubumi Adigun. Oh, oh yes, 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 I re- yes. remember, yeah. Remember, remember. Very strong defender. Scarf, remember the scarf on his neck? The yes, white color yes. scarf, yes. He was a, you know, oh, it's a beast of a player. Uh, you, you can imagine going up against him, you know, and wow, tough, tough to go up against him, you know, looking looking at his size and his height. Whoa, man, he was a beast. But I and I think, I, uh, but I, for former I knew, players, I also mentioned this. But I knew that Nigeria qualified for USA 94. 
Of course, I didn't uh, took into consideration to look into the details of that Nigeria team. Yeah, there was a part of me that felt that I was actually telling my classmate, "Hey guys, we're waiting to see Lawley. We are going to play in the World Cup. We're going to watch him in the World Cup." And then when I saw his name was missing, I'm kind of finding like, "What the hell is going on here? How come they missed out?" Then it didn't. I mean, at that time, I never really took. Then only realized, you know, actually, you know, of course, you know, Lawley, he's, he's, a, he's. I mean, he's a he's a top class defender, but it turns out, you know, I mean, there. Are, Players that I would say a bigger beast than him, playing in, in far more superior leagues in the world. I mean, that's when I got yeah. to know that Nigeria uh, squad from '94. Yeah, and one more player, oh. Manjaman. Quite a yes. quite a unique name. That's what stands out for me, Manjaman. And going back to that final, okay, '93 final. Okay, Singapore lost the league to Kedah. If I'm not mistaken, is that right, Gary? They lost to um, Kedah in the actually league. in the league itself. Or was it to they in, Selangor? It, Selangor. They were in Division Two. Kedah yeah. was in Division Two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But Kedah won the Division One title. Singapore yeah. was second in the Division Two, right? Correct. Yeah. So going to that final, you know, um, I was in Malaysia and in KL itself, but I wasn't at Merdeka Stadium. Uh, I was in a relative's house, so this is a difficult time for me, man. All my, you know, cousins are all rooting for Kedah because obviously Malaysian team. <laughs> I'm from coming from Singapore, so you know I'm, you know, completely in this caught up in all this fever, you know, Malaysia Cup fever, the Singapore Dream Team, and all. I'm a big fan of Singapore at that point of time, and uh, only, but actually, just to share, only in the Malaysia Cup when it came to. National team, I didn't support Singapore, strangely enough, but that's how the family influence was. But yeah, going to that final, I was the only one supporting uh, Singapore and was deeply disappointed when they lost. It was also a rainy day. It was a bit rainy, I think. I, I think Singa- somebody from mistaken. Singapore missed the penalty, right? Yeah, Alistair Edwards missed the penalty. I was going to get to that point. Okay. Alistair Edwards missed the penalty. Um... There was something shared with me in uh, in confidence that the game was kind of uh, fixed. That someone already knew the he, he someone mentioned that okay the scoreline will be two 0 Kedah will win Singapore will miss one penalty exactly that happened so that builds up nicely to what we're going to speak about next. Part of what we're going to speak about next. The next season, of course, 1994, the trend continued. Singapore won the league, won the double. And Gary, I, maybe now it's your turn to shine. Yep. It's so the time when you happened, started watching. Hmm, actually, what happened then was after the 1993 Cup, Malaysia Cup final defeat, Singapore made a couple of monumental changes in their squad lineup. Very monumental. The starting goalkeeper, Abdul Malik, who was then our yeah. best goalkeeper, and v- but he Sudu made the he... errors in the 93 final, right? Well, there was that and a few years later, he was suspended by Balestia and was banned for football for match fixing, which yes. was quite unfortunate because David Lee once rated Abdul Malik as his closest challenger to the number one jersey, the best challenger during his time as a national goalkeeper. So the other one was obviously V. Sudramuti. And when yeah. that shakeup happened and there was also that controversy involving... Cam Warden coming to Singapore in January, oh, yeah. leaving yeah. just weeks before the season the... started. Correct. And Douglas Moore, who was then appointed as a technical director, stepped in. So what actually happened was there was quite a bit of upheaval during that whole process, especially the supporters of Peace Sudrabuti who were disappointed that their hero was dropped. Abdul mm. Malik less so, but the anger from the both of them was quite evident on the papers. Then you got players who were unsettled by how Cam Warder was training them. So thereafter, Cam Warder actually eventually resigned for reasons that he knew that time the new paper went very big. Where is Cam Warder? Why did he resign? Like all the big saga, you know how new paper went big these days. Yeah. Jeffrey yeah. Lowe, as Gulam. I think there were a few more new paper guys. They were really onto this lead up during the campaign. I still remember they also had a lead up to the opening game of the season where they had a like 20 page special involving the team. Like how mm. who are your defenders, who are your goalkeepers, who are who are your key players, how is the team likely to fare, and so on and so forth. So looking into the 94 season. Hey, Alistair Edwards leave also? Uh 
Uh, he left for Selangor. Yeah. He went to yeah. Selangor. Yeah. So, so he, that's the that's the third uh, departure from that ninety three team. But the departure was less acrimonious than the first two, and actually there was also a bit of renewal going on in the national team in Singapore in ninety four. Lee Man Hon had really, it was into his second year. Rafi Ali probably mm. second or first year. Then there were mm. a couple of youngsters also coming into the squad. So you got your yeah. veterans and your young players, a decent mix. You still have your Abbas, Chang Jun, and this time round Michael Vada, who oh. returned after ninety two. Yeah. And, uh, Michael Vada is what we're going to speak about next. Also, after, yeah, on this in the same year, um. Correct. Yeah, uh, and also the young players you were mentioning. I think Kade Yaya and all were these guys already considered young or Kade experienced was, think, players at this time. Kade is, I think, into his third year in the national team in the Malaysia Cup. Mm. Uh, relatively young. Nasri, even though he was young, he was already established. Established. Yeah. Steven Tan. Uh, Steven Tan was first spotted in ninety two, so around the same time. Uh, Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush was mid season in ninety four. Oh, yes. Season. Uh, ninety four. Yeah, also had the younger ones. That's why he matter. That's why he's another player. Oh yes, remember. correct. He he established himself as a starting left back after during that campaign. Hmm. And I got to share also. I found, I know Steven was a big fan of Singapore in this year. Is that right, Steven? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was. I mean, uh, there's not, nothing to be ashamed about. In fact, uh, they were my team that year, simply because you know my icon, my idol during those era was Abba Saad. I I, hmm. I did. I haven't seen a footballer like him. I mean, of course. When people ask me who was the, the greatest ever footballer you've seen in the Malaysian League, I didn't have a chance to see the likes of Santok Singh, the late Moftadari, or yeah. you know Ar Mugam and all that because their era was yeah. be before by us, the time yeah. by the time I could remember or recall watching football, they are pretty much you know they are already gone already. So yeah. it was Abbas who was the player that really made me fall in love with watching the Malaysian Football League, especially Correct. what he did in Johor in 1991. And then, of course, in '94 with the uh, uh, with the Singapore team, and uh, I don't say is that I I I used to think that this was a Singapore dream team. I didn't know that the dream team was actually coined for the team the year before that. The year season before I, that, yeah. I always thought this was the dream team because they achieved the double that year, you know, and mm-hmm. they were unstoppable. I mean, I know for a fact that uh, a lot of uh, again, I, I must say that. Um, I I had a good time with against all my Slango classmates because you know I was having the best of them in '91, and I also had uh. the best of them in '94. On both occasion, Abbas, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not to say, I mean, sorry, on this occasion, of course, is uh, Abbas and all that disappoint break, breaking their hearts, you know, and making me a happy guy. That, that was school, quite like. a good semi final. No? I I remember Singapore getting battered, but hung on at Shah Alam Stadium. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. I mean, it was one of those days when. Uh, It's one of those days when Shalam, you know, for a Slango game, you could get eighty thousand people inside the stadium. Yeah, full house, full house. Oh, so, at Slango, we were like half ten, puff ten, half ten, puff. But it just couldn't score enough goals to overturn yeah. the deficit from the first leg. And Singapore scored the vital goals as well to make sure they edged into the final. Gary, you were mentioning about uh, Sundram's acrimonious exit. What was the reason behind it? Well, it was partially linked to something that you wanted to talk about. Somebody there was oh. allegations that Sundram had probably thrown a few games here and there allegations, but mm. but they were probably later cover up once he became part of the Young Lions coach where they buried the hatchet. FAS and um, Sundram buried the hatchet on this matter. That's why Sundram mm. was allowed to prosper in the coaching scene in Singapore in the mid two thousands. But after ninety three, Sudram never played for Singapore again. Yes, but he still managed to draw crowds in the S League, or even when he signed for Woodlands, who were then playing in that. Not team. not for the national team as well. Oh, uh, never. Not after ninety three, oh. no more. Okay. No more. No, oh, that's an that's interesting. I thought he still got no. selected for the national team. Abbasat still managed to play after the Kelong scandal for the national team. Abbasat mm. he still managed to play one more. Oh, yeah, yeah. He he was called out by Terry Annabels. Correct. Yeah. yeah, so that that leads us. Okay, of course, the final was an epic final. Four nil. I mean, Pahang, Pahang is a good team. Not not that Pahang is a poor team or a weak team and all, but to beat them four nil in the final, that's something else altogether. I think first half was already three nil. 
But so I'm not mistaken, uh, we're missing da- Alan Davidson, who was suspended after a red card in the second league semi-final. Ah, ah okay, that, okay, that detail I didn't uh, know. I, did, did Pahang, I remember, don't remember. Who did Pahang open the semi-final? I'm trying to recall. Pahang probably be Perak. Perak, I think. Perak, oh, okay, okay, all right. And that, and then, uh, okay, so then Singapore won the, did the double, everyone's enjoying themselves here. Yeah. What's the, this matches, uh, Steven, Singapore's matches uh, from from Shah Alam, how do you manage to watch uh, Singapore's matches in the league, not not the final? Well, you know, the back then, we used, we don't really used to have that many live games, so it's quite yeah. limited. So, the... So just the one game, was... I think, one game a week, right? Probably you get one game you a get... week. In fact, surprisingly, even for the league decider between Singapore and Kedah, we also didn't have a, had a chance to watch the game live. I, but, mm. I mean, I Malaysia, like... I, I, maybe in Singapore, you guys had it, but we didn't really have it here in Malaysia. I think yeah, it's yeah. because of the problem. <laughs> the dif- I wouldn't want to say differences between Singapore and Malaysia on the TV side issue because that issue still persisted in the Lions Shelf era. But I do recall from my side that there were a lot of those Singapore games with, on occasion, a number of TMP journalists crossing the border to watch a few rival games, especially when Kerda was playing. Kerda, Kerda was playing one team in the league. Jeff Freelow went to watch to act as a so-called spy for the team. Yeah. But that time, uh, I didn't watch live match until the Malaysia Cup Final 94. So much of it, I listened on radio. So that... Then when yeah. people oh, still okay. enjoy listening to the radio, following the commentary, uh, how they and their captivating commentary to keep yeah. us. So you've never been to the um national stadium in those days? Oh uh, no. Okay. Yeah, me too. I didn't, but, and but also I follow actually, the I papers. Got a, I gotta attribute my poor eyesight to the Singapore national Singapore team in the Malaysia Cup because from 93 I watched and I would always be very close to the TV we were sitting close to the TV watching the games <laughs> and then that's how my eyesight got spoiled and started wearing specs so yeah so thanks to Singapore I, I, was, I was lucky enough to watch the final because um, I was shifting house that day in, so, in, the, in the stadium no 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 uh, on that day at the final the day of the final on so TV, yeah. it yeah, so it was kind of you know, as, as you know back then in the nineties when you're shifting house trying to set up your TV is not as easy as it is today. Somebody has to go climb up the roof to go and set up yeah. the aerial and all that all that kind of stuff. Also, so yeah. I I pested, I think I pested my dad or one of my uncle. I said, look, I need to watch this final tonight. If the house is not ready, it's fine, but at least make sure the TV is ready. So we your were priorities, watching, you got it set. <laughs> so I so we were basically watching the what the TV just with a very small space confined in front of it for us to sit down because everywhere else in the hall is still with all the cupboards and boxes of the house. It's still not yet been mm. dismantled or put in its proper place. Uh, mm. even, I mean, we could have done it on that day, but I said, no, no, no. Tonight, like, I just want to, let me just focus the game. Tomorrow, I'll do everything for you all. Don't worry, no problem. <laughs> so, yeah. That's some uh, very, very nice memories. I mean, pleasant memories. And... The unpleasant memories after that final, the explosion of the match fixing scandal. I think the two of you actually, actually, I mean, it wasn't just after the came final. as a shock. Pardon? Actually, it, it, was it actually brewing. wasn't after the final. It was throughout the whole se- year, throughout the whole year. And when huh. you read the paper, suddenly you're getting this thing called match fixing, match fixing. And at that time, it was too hard for me to comprehend actually yeah. how deep is this problem and what is actually Correct. the issue, what's actually going on as- here. Yeah, exactly. The same thing as me as well. I also heard of all these terms, match fixing, and Singapore coined a word called Kelong yeah. in uh, in those years. They and call actually, it Kelong. Hmm. So you you keep reading about it in newspapers. You kept reading, okay, this guy got caught for match fixing, he's charged, he banned from football and all, but what does it mean? You don't know. And how many players were involved, managers. And uh, there was a lot of rumors also. A lot of people saying, oh, so and so was involved. And, yeah. and like, in Singapore, I think all the prominent players were also uh, said to be involved. You Actually, know, all your fundies and all. They were all hooked in and said, okay, these guys probably been involved as well. All these rumours were flying about. Well, actually in 1994, what happened was there was actually a match-fixing case on trial that involved David Lee's uh, local club employers, Changi United. Yeah. Okay. And David Lee, I think, probably was implicated in it. 
even though it was mm. a team manager who was sent to jail for for the offenses. And actually, mm. the first time I heard about the match fixing much closely is when Singapore was closing towards the title. But it first came into prominence during the 1994 Asian Games in Hiroshima when Malaysia sent one player home, uh, Chong Chong King Kong Yap of Penang. Like after the first game, he was sent home because the police wanted him for investigations. Claude Leroy was a very unfortunate coach of Malaysia then. Mm. Very unfortunate. Yeah. The, I think that is the one blot from the, this French guy's uh, checkered international history. But after that, that exploded, especially after the Malaysia Cup final, when one day, out of the blue, you see the reports. 100 over players, managers, officials, yeah. and a number of them were prominent, including the Dan Perak, goalkeeper Nazrin Chong, I think if I'm not wrong, Wong Kok Sam, Ali Jina, then later as the Kedah Young, promising young duo, uh, v, as Tina Segaran, I think, if I'm not wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this young striker, Farizan Che Hamid from Kedah as well. So mm. it's like almost the whole peninsula and probably and Sabah, they were deeply affected by it. Singapore, mm. one of the rumors involving why Singapore left the Malaysia Cup in 95 has partly to do with this, partly. But obviously, okay. Although I've heard another an, another prominent place, Azizul Abu Hanifa. Oh Era yes, legend. correct. Oh yes, yeah. yes. But Azizul managed to recover and play later on after his suspension. One of the rare few who managed to play on. Mm. The rest, many of them never played again. And I, if I recall correctly, once they were deemed to be guilty, they were all dispatched to far away places, and that's it. Yeah. Everything disappeared from there. One, one of the things in Malaysia, what they do is that uh, players either they, I mean, I don't think many of the players went to prison or jail for for their crime. Exactly. But uh, more, more more of them were sent into exile. Basically, you know, they were asked to. Uh, I mean, the, the term in Malaysia is called buang daerah, lah. Basically, which means uh, mm. they cannot be staying there. They cannot be staying there. Uh, working in a specific town, they have to be going somewhere else, and um, what else? Of course, career came to a premature end. Lah. Yeah, mm. and I think that and was uh, yeah, it okay, basically okay. it basically had a huge like what Gary said. It had basically a pro- profound effect on the talent pool, and whereby at that time you know our national team coach was Claude Leroy, and he had quite a, a very tough, a difficult time lah because uh, there was no young blood coming in because most of them were affected, and he still needed to rely on Zainal and Dola who were already you know on the on the, the I think they're already in the thirties already. already. Yeah, and so it was. Asman Adar is your only strong mid- young striker. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it didn't, a... I mean, the, the whole thing didn't end on that year itself. It even continued for several more years. I oh. mean, it was quite painful uh, at, at that time when to see all this happening. And as I mentioned, you know, I didn't really understand exactly what was the, the issue behind it. But and for me at the time, I took it a bit personally against the players because I felt like, you know, they really betrayed. The trust that I we as fans have in them, oh, but yeah, I can understand. Yeah. Looking back now, I can understand why many of them had to do it because you know mm. it was a semi-pro era. Things mm. were not uh, sanctioned properly. You know the 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 terms honoring contracts was not really given the the respect is due. And when you are a football player, especially in a semi-pro time where you you are you are not paid so well, whether in your full-time job or even in your football career, you know, desperation hits the roof. And what choice do you have when you have family to feed, you know, house to pay, bills to, you know, all those things. So, it, uh, of course, I'm not justifying what they've done, but I can understand the why did they reason. Did it? Yeah, why did they did it? Hmm. Okay. And then, uh, for, so from 94, then Singapore pulled out of the league at the end of the season. was disappointing to... It find was that a shocker, out. a big shocker when I read it in the paper. It was, yeah, a big shocker and a disappointment. And I mean, the conspiracy theories was also that uh, Malaysia couldn't take it, that Singapore won the double, so, you know, off they go. <laughs> that's a common now, uh, conspiracy theory here. Well, if that's the case, they should have kicked us out after in 1978 and in 1981, but we still stayed. <laughs> or, actually, even in all those uh, pre-independence Malaysia Cup winning years, they could also have kicked us out. In fact, mm. I would just say one trivia, which was in the book. Actually, that time in 1931, after Singapore won the 
Malaya Cup with your military players, all the other Malaysian states start complaining. So the complaints all began from that first year. So, okay. but, but that said also, the official excuse was due to the allocation, the match ticket allocation, the gate, the gate receipts. But I think mm. there's something a bit more to it, but I think it's best not to go too deep into it lest we get found out. But the thing for the need for survival is really there. And I think it's a it's like until professionalism really begin to take roots in Malaysia, I think especially once PFAM come in, once TMJ begin to reform, I think particularly after that, that's when things begin to be in place. Although you there's, there's you still talk, issues, bro. There are still, yes, correct. But one thing we're just not being paid. I know, correct. But once Singapore is out, not, uh, not getting paid is one thing. Owner justifying why the players are not getting paid <laughs> is even <a> better. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I heard uh, of that. What? Yeah. Cup noodles with Malaysia Cup. What is that? I heard that from Bear. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's uh that's a story of today. So yeah, okay. Talking about nicer things. Back to nicer things now. Uh, the Bonio teams. What do you remember of them? Uh, I recently just featured the Sarawak team, and they they were quite a formidable team. I remember, uh, in that in those years. Under Alan Sabah Bear. was also not easy to play against. I just, just want to add a bit a bit like, on the Singapore's exit uh, from Malaysian football at the time. Uh, I, I, like like you guys, it was a shock for me. I mean, when I read the papers, it came out of nowhere. Like, mm. you were not, we were not, I think nobody was prepared for this. Not and even the players it, also. They were already yeah, training towards the campaign. They were even yeah. saying who were the players who were coming through, who were the foreigners they signed. Even Kalish was the replacement striker for, I think, Abbasad or Maivana. Mm-hmm. Then it, there was also young players, Reza Hassan, and who was already in the team, Zukana Zaino, who was actually supposed to be in the squad. They were supposed to be in there, but because of the exit of the Malaysia Cup, they never got to play in one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I felt a bit a, a deep hole uh, for me because uh, you know I wasn't sure how I'm going to cope with the the new season, you know, in terms of, you know, because you have to remember up to that point, the, you know, the rivalry between Singapore and Solano was such a big thing in Malaysian yeah. football at the time. Yeah, right. So without it, I was just wondering, but this is where my love affair with the teams from Borneo picked up. This is where I started okay. to appreciate the teams from Sabah and Sarawak picked up because, you know, mm. in the nineties, if you look at it, they suddenly they became more, they, they became more prominent. They were challenging for honors. They started to winning things. And, you know, there's always yeah. this era. I always, uh, remember saying to people uh, about Sarawak in the 90s uh, because just to divert a little bit in 97 when I sat for my high school exam one of the things that you need to do you need to do for you need to go for your oral exam mm. so the day before the oral uh, that exam basically I was st- you know reviewing all the, the heavy subjects like you know, business industry politics those kind of things because I hardly, I, these are the kind of topics I believe the teacher will be asking. Okay. So on the day when I went for the exam, uh, as the, it, you will be asked to call into a room where you'll be seated in front of three teachers. Who, they will evaluate you, asking you questions and all that. So I walked in, feeling nervous. The first question came up from the teacher's mouth is, do you like football? <laughs> I, wow. knew, I, I knew this is a slaughterhouse. I knew I'm going to commit three murders here already. I knew it already. <laughs> And seriously, wow. by, the time I, by the time I walked out, the whole room literally was a horror movie scene. It was filled with blood. It was filled with blood. Because the question was, you know, first, what, do you like football? Uh, what do you think about foreign uh, foreign uh, coaches and players coming to Malaysian football? And can you give an example? My perfect example at that time was Sarawak football. Because Sarawak football, there was an era before Alan Vest and after Alan Vest. Okay. When mm-hmm. he came yes. in, Sarawak not only became a team that started winning, but became a force in Malaysian football. Mm, correct. Yeah. And, and the same thing I also can say for Sabah, uh, with the arrival of Scott Olorencho and all that. Because mm. if you look at it, I, I did list it down. 92, Sarawak won the FA Cup. 93, 94, Sabah were runners up in the FA Cup. 95, finally, third time they won it. 96, they won the Liga Perdana. Sarawak were runners up in the FA Cup. Sabah were runners up in Malaysia Cup. Sarawak won the Liga uh, Premier League in 97 and Sabah yeah. were runners up in the FA Cup. And 1999, finally, a team from Borneo managed to bring the Malaysia Cup back. back Brunei. Uh, I mean, sorry, it was Brunei. 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 Yes. Brunei uh, against Sarawak. Sarawak. Yeah. This was the first non peninsula Malaysia Cup final. Yes. So you can see. 
Yeah, so you can see that era, you know, Sabah and Sarawak, they really produced so many outstanding players in that era. So, yeah. yeah. So that they took, sort of filled in the gap that which Singapore left for me. Hmm. Yes, I want to mention from that Sarawak team, of course, Mazlan Wahid was a goalie. Oh, yes. John Hunter, John Hunter was a the big pain, striker. Was a big yeah. pain. He was so difficult to mark. He had the uh, you know Gigi Boge. His, <laughs> his oh yeah, yeah, state. correct. Now yeah. he's retired and quite fat in Australia. Yeah, yeah. He was already big in uh, when he was playing football as a as a professional. Uh, Right. Or rather, semi-professional. In fact, the league became professional in '94. Uh, became Liga right. Perdana, no more semi-pro league, right? Yeah. Nah, uh, it was still a semi-pro status, but the league was only rebranded as a Premier League. Rebranded. M League. Oh, okay. It was called yeah, M League. It became, I think, it became only hmm. fully professional in 1996. Hmm. Okay. So you've mentioned this this team '95. What happens? Even we lost touch already. We. We lost touch with Malaysian football after Singapore left the league. Tell us what happened in '95. Well, uh, Sabah won the FA Cup. They managed to breeze through. They beat Pahang in the final, three zero. Uh, I can't remember who scored the goal, but of course, uh, you know, you had Madlan Marjan and Scott Olorenzo. The twin partnership up front so devastating. Uh, Madlan Marjan, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, I think they were kind of expected to win the league that year. And think I think mm. for the first seven games they were breezing through, they were whacking everybody. You know, like they were winning like out of seven games, they won out of eight games, they won seven games or something. Then mm. you know, as we, as I mentioned earlier, the scandal of '94 didn't stop there. Uh, mm. Again, out of sudden, that. yes, out of sudden, Sa Matla Marjan together with uh, about six or seven, eight key players. But well, Sabah well, were already affected from '94 as well because '94. I remember after that infamous zero seven nil win at National Stadium for Singapore. Sabah suddenly suspended five players, including your cap, the captain, the goalkeeper. Oh, I remember the reserve goalkeeper was Austin Oro, who, who and Pablo Mani. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So Austin Oro had to be go for the rest of the season. Poor him, not the best, but you are stuck because your first choice goalkeeper was suspended. Hmm. Sarawak actually was one of the main beneficiaries because they were one of the one or the I think probably the only state that's not badly affected by the scandal, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I have all the key players. Because yeah, because we also have Ong Kim Sui, Charlie Abdul Ramli, the captain. Mm, yeah, Ong Kim Sui. Yeah. Then that time Fendi, you Fendi got Fendi Jeff Kiram, Jeff Car Karan, the sweeper, the. Fendi Julaili was there. Uh, right, Samsuri yes. Abdul Rahman. Oh, yeah, yep, Samsuri Abdul yeah. Rahman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Fendi Julaili, yes. yes. Yeah. And um, also this 95 season bucked the trend, right? The It was no longer a double winning season for the league champions. Well, actually, we were, most of us thought it was going to go in that direction because Pang won the Premier League. They took the Premier yeah. League title. And in the semi final, um, they overcome Sabah. They managed mm. to be. I, I, in fact, to be honest, ninety the the Malaysia Cup final ninety five. It could we were expecting on paper, you expecting to be an all Borneo final, because both okay. Sarawak and Sabah were considered like the, the form team at that time. But okay. surprisingly, Sarawak choked in Kuching. They lost to Selangor three one, and you know, sorry three two, and they could only manage to secure a goalless draw in Shah Alam. Oh, Whereas mm. Sabah, on the other hand, um, they. Were expected. To, I mean, they had a full house crowd in Likas, but you know they lost one year. Scott Lorenzo, I think, uh, missed a penalty shoot over the goalpost. But you know, in the second leg, they actually came back. They came back and scored one. They won one nil. Managed to force to get the penalties, but that's when they they lost to Pahang. So mm. you know, with Pahang and Selangor in the final, of course, you know the expectation is that you know Pahang, um, basically already won the Premier League. They're expected to win the Malaysia Cup double, but it was another. With a very epic finale whereby you know you had chances going on both ends and it was the first time ever the final was decided on what we what we used to call the golden goal rule scored okay. by none other than david mitchell himself uh, david mitchell, whom, right? we, yeah. whom in the we had a, a, the privilege of interviewing him in the bola bola show together with sharil ashraf another player from that slango legendary slango side yeah i remember the episode yeah and um Maybe if I one team, one team you forgot to mention. I think we need to speak about them. Perlis. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And they had oh, they oh. had a certain player who was a. I I I, I, I don't know, lah, bro. <laughs> I don't know, but when I read the newspaper, I was trying to think to myself, this is a joke or what? <laughs> Because <laughs> Polish did quite bad in the year before that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've always but been then, like whipping boys, right? But then, right. Year, then yeah, I, I would say you know they probably made the sign of the season in in a, a player called Emil Mbobo. <laughs> Those yeah. who don't know, Mbou, Mbou. Mbou. Don't know, he was a, a Cameroon legend for the indomitable Lion teams from Italia ninety. Yep. I think the mm. player who was sort of given the responsibility to man mark Maradona, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> mm. So, but he came. He there was a there was a an aura like the whole team was galvanized and that was the time that Perlis just opened their new stadium the Kanga stadium they were playing in the floodlights for the first time prior to this most of the games Perlis were played in the afternoon, afternoon game with their old stadium yeah, yeah. 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 i think same thing also goes for sabah sabah used to sabah, play in yeah, correct. stadium sabah also just... played in the afternoon yeah yeah so little i mean they, surprisingly they you know they Pulled it off. They managed to qualify for for the Malaysia Cup. I mean, the context is that back then you do well in the league, you qualify to the Malaysia Cup. That is some kind of an achievement. Uh. So, mm-hmm. Perlis was one of the team, and another team that's you know surprised us the whole year was Brunei. Mm-hmm. Man, how, how did they do? How you know they were? They, Brunei yeah, they was they another one that's like whipping boys, right? Yeah, yeah. You well, remember them? They were they were whipping boys. But I think Brunei they were unaffected by the Geelong scandal, so they had much of the team intact, and they had the better imports as well. If I'm not wrong, Pro- probably, mm. probably in the entire league, the better paid play, uh, paid players. Correct. Yes, 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 yes. And, that's true. And tax, Undoubtedly. And tax free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened in the '96 final? Sava against uh, Slango. So this time, this time your your classmates had the better of you, or, or in fact you had already left school, I guess at that time. Oh no, no, still in school, still. I mean, I was okay. in form four at that time. Um, okay. Of course, this time you you could say my Slango classmates had the the the, the what do you call it? The last laugh. The last laugh, lah, basically. Uh, but again, it was another final that was very intense because uh, you know both Sabah and Sabah and Slango were really going at each other. But I think uh, Slango were purely much dominating the game because it's almost like playing on home home field, home home ground. And mm. you know, I don't think there were that many Sabah fans who actually travel to watch the game because you got to remember this was pre Asia days, so ticket price can be very yeah. expensive. Not yeah. many people who could afford it. So it, it was almost like a Slango home game. And uh, Karol Azman, who was a Sabah goalkeeper at that time, earlier mm. we mentioned he was in Bahang. So he was a, a wall. A man, man was a, a wall that day. I mean, every single attempt they couldn't penetrate him. And even one point, Slango had a penalty. He saved the penalty. Mm. Unfortunately, mm. he was only penalty. the hero. Ah, uh, was it Scott Lorenzo? I think so. I can't remember. Scott Lorenzo yeah. was playing for Slango at that time, '96. Saba, Saba. Oh, Saba. Yeah. So. Cairo Azman only became the hero in 120 minutes because in the penalty shootout, he was a Slango goalkeeper. I'm trying to recall his name. He was the hero and helped uh, Slango to defend the, the Malaysia Cup title. Mm. And uh, talking about Slango, so that season, did Slango win the league? No, Sabah took the, Sabah, Sabah took the Premier League title. First time Sabah the Premier League took title, the Premier League title. Oh. First time the Premier League Sabah. title won the Borneo side. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty formidable team then. Um... Uh, Sabah had so this was basically a final and uh, in the league campaign in fact Slango where did they finish? I think Slango finished remember? in the top top 4 top 3 Sabah was first I think maybe Slango was second or maybe Slango either Slango or Kedah was second hmm. yeah. yeah okay so it, it's been some time since Slango won the league right we're speaking about this we've not mentioned too much about Slango they won the they won the Malaysia Cup twice now, 95, 96, but not yet the league. And talking about Slango also, they had signed a pretty, pretty big signing. They made a very, very big signing called Tony Cotti, someone we are all <laughs> familiar with because if you watch English League, you know who he is, a uh, former West Ham player. He suddenly appeared in uh, in Malaysian shores and played for Slango. And even the new paper reported it from Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> And he got a shock of his life when he found out he had to wash his own boots. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that story. 
and also was, had to endure something. a much different culture with his team captain. I mean, uh, it, it it was definitely a cultural shock to him for for a lot of reason from where he used to be and where he's coming from. Correct. But uh, mm. you know, it, it still amazes me how did Slango pulled off the signing. Uh, because if I'm not mistaken, it was the first ever million ringgit signing. Yeah, mi- yeah million yeah. Uh, ringgit. Was it or US dollars? Yeah, it was. Or oh, maybe paid. US dollar. I can't remember what currency it was, but I know it was a million. Yeah, but I, I know, I know it was a million. million. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it just uh, solidifies Slango's stature during that era of why they were known as a red giant. They had you know the biggest stadium in the country. They had the biggest following. You know they are uh, they, they pulled the biggest crowd, and of course you know for someone who that era you know anything. You know, you had the Red Devils in in England. You had the Red Giants here. They're almost the same. I hated both of them. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I hated both of them. <laughs> so, but of course, you know, unfortunately, by the mid '90s to the late '90s, I wasn't having the the, the last laugh on on more on both aspects, lah. You could say that. Yeah. yeah. Can imagine that. And uh, he didn't last long in uh, Malaysian football. Nah, he didn't last long. In fact. Uh, There's a lot of stories behind it exactly why his departure. Some even argue that he actually even suspected that some of the games were thrown away because he couldn't believe that when Slango were leading two nil against Pera and they end up losing three two. If there was a lot of things going behind the scene, and uh, next thing I think I don't know whether we ex- anticipated it or not, but next thing we realize he's no longer in Slango. He's turning up for Leicester City in the new Premier League season. Oh, scoring yeah. in a one nil win <laughs> against Manchester United, <laughs> and uh, he did, did he score a lot of goals in Malaysian football. I don't think he scored that many. Uh, I mean, he did score, but not that many. And partly because you know, um, local players at that time, they had this swagger in them. They mm. were not going to be dictated be by anybody. And especially mm. in a in a player like Azman Anan, who controls the dressing room very strongly, has the commanding respect among all the players and coaches. And mm. this is not just you know simply what you call buta buta respect. He yeah. he has the control he in the dressing room it. and he proves he it, it right? on the field. I mean, yeah. he proves it on the field. You know, the mountain man score is 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 legend. And you know he. I would kind of say that to some degree, maybe Tony Curtis' ego was. A bit goyang after seeing uh, after seeing that you know a lot this local lad. I think it's not just Asmal Adan. There's also the team captain Ismail Ibrahim, who was also quite influential in the dressing room as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Tony Cotty was then replaced by another player that played in the Premier League. In fact, be- before the show as well, Gary pointed out another player that played in the Premier League that played in the Malaysian uh, Malaysian League in around that time. David Rocasel, former yeah, Arsenal David player, yeah. played. Yeah, the late David Rocasel played for Sabah. Sabah, yes. Was Quite he part of that team that won the league? No, he he, he only came in in '97. He didn't. He was done there '96. But uh, hmm. I understand from many of my friends who follow the Sabah football team back then. You know, David Rocasel commands a huge respect among the Sabah team because uh, he, when he came, he point. He did. I mean. He did pointed out what was wrong in terms of how the players uh, carry themselves, how they take care of themselves, and everything. But he also was guiding them, teaching them. You know, as professional, yeah, uh, as professional footballers, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you get things done. You know, as opposed to trying to be a superstar, you know, showing off anything. But he he sort of, uh, you know, took that leadership mantle within the team. And, and I think most of the players today, fans alike, speak highly of him. Hmm. Okay, and then Chris Kivomia came. That's another one. For, I think at that point he played for what Ipswich, if I'm not mistaken, former Ipswich player. I know he's he an Arsenal, a, but I don't know where the clubs. Yeah, Arsenal. Yeah, I think Arsenal was only after his spell in Slango. Uh, but uh, oh, what, what impact did he have on the Slango team? Did he was he like uh, Tony Cotty or was he more like David Rocasel? I would say it's more like David Rocasel. I think he endeared himself to the team, and of course, you know, he became the hero in the Malaysia Cup final that year. Uh, again, Slango played Pahang, and I think it was again a golden goal, if I'm not mistaken. He scored, yeah. 
And uh, yeah, he was actually on loan from Arsenal that season. At Slango. For, for Slango, you know. Oh, so that's, they were rumours. They were rumours actually rare. Ian Wright was coming to Slango, you know. They were oh, rumours. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that didn't work out, huh? okay. Yeah, Gary, you were saying something? I was actually surprised that he came on loan. I thought he was bought. Chris Q. Okay. I that was this is the first time I heard that he came that a player came on loan from a Premier League club to Malaysia. That is a rare thing. It's quite rare yeah. from Premier League. Had, if you say lower so, league, it's possible, but yeah, true. But I think by but then, I think his, that, his that position get... in Arsenal wasn't. I mean, he wasn't really a, a surplus to requirement because yeah. this was Arsenal in the years of Arsene Wenger, so they were correct. already yeah, consolidating correct, correct. a team that's going to win the Premier League. Obviously, yeah. had no place there. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Steven also mentioned earlier that, you know, the kind of foreigners Malaysian football attracted in those days was something else altogether. Yeah. I don't so know whether the... you guys remember. I don't yeah. know whether you guys remember who was the top scorer that season from Pera. Kali Jamlus? Nah. Well, was before his time, right? I don't remember, man. He came in halfway the season and ended up being the top scorer for Pera. Who? I think it's Laszlo Res- Respasi, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that name's quite familiar now. Yeah. Yeah. Laszlo Respasi. And we didn't talk much about Pera. Was, uh, I don't remember Pera being strong probably in the northeast, but in and around this time, I think, do you think Pera was, uh, what did, how good were Pera? I mean, they were definitely a mainstay. A, a mainstay, yep, correct. Laszlo Respasi, he came in 97, scored 19 goals in 26 appearance for Pera. So, yeah, wow. he was he was a predatory goal scorer at that era. The thing is mm. about Pera, that era, I wouldn't say they... You, I mean, they, how do I put it? Uh? I mean, if I were to pick a team and compare them in, in English football, um, not a team that is going to challenge for honours, but a team that definitely is a force to be reckoned with. Mm. You know, I don't know whether you want to put them in, in the category of Spurs or... I mean, I'm not too, too sure where you guys want to put them. I but think at that era, they're a good team. compare it to Chelsea a bit. Chelsea, Chelsea yeah. Probably, so I was thinking like Chelsea, in, the, Chelsea in that era. Probably Chelsea, yeah. They yeah, were winning Chelsea cups and all, but... But this era wasn't winning trophies in that era. That time hasn't mm. yet arrived. It will come mm. if, in another few years down the road. But for during that 90s, the mid-90s, They were a team that would challenge for things, but they don't necessarily win it. They really had a good team, and going to Ipoh wasn't really an easy ground for any team visiting team. It's always going to be a tough mm. place to play. Mm. And Slango, so Slango completed a three peat of the Malaysia Cup titles, ah, uh, um, 95, 96, 97. That's something. Yep. But they haven't won the league, and it just got worse in 98. What happened <laughs> to Slango then? Honestly, by this time, uh, I have to be honest, you know, Malaysian football was pretty much taking a backseat. Um, is it? Yeah, we can see that uh, the decline for the local game was sort of going downwards. I think a lot of it has to do with the disappointment when the national team didn't achieve winning a medal in the SEA Games in 97. Uh, mm. There was a lot of hope uh, for that. That team to continue to do well, but that didn't happen. And I think you know, in in a way, '97 also was the year that when Malaysia went through a very tough recession and yeah. uh, it's financial so crisis, yeah. financial crisis. And I think it also badly affected on the league on the on the teams as well. Actually, and also, I, I have a question here for you guys because I thought that it was in the immediate aftermath of the match fixing scandal that swept the peninsula that impacted the league, but. 95, 96, the crowds did not go down yet, is it? No, 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 not at all. In fact, you know, whenever I hear people complain about, you know, max fixing and all that, that affected, no, not really. Because you see, even 95, 96, 97, you still had that huge support for, for the local game. People still will go out and watch, you know, ah, Malaysian football. Right. And, uh, and yeah, you can put it to blame on Astro for bringing Premier League into this show and making it free, more easily available. But you have to bear in mind, yeah. Even in the 90s, you know, not everybody can afford Astro. Astro wasn't yeah, really cheap. Correct, yeah, correct. Yeah. I, I yeah. think for a package of that era, you have to pay almost in the range. With, I, I can't remember what's the figure. But you're talking about somewhere in the 600, 5 to 600. Wow. Which is a lot of money for 97, huh? not now. 
97 and so also, it's and also we had to like go and we want to watch it we had to go to a shop to watch it a mama shop or a oh, you know see for shop oh, or something that's a challenge that's a challenge because it's so expensive mama shop also one day one couldn't afford it so the only place you can go is uh, you know like bangsa to a club or bars and all that and you know mm. that time when mo- most of us especially those around my age you know we we were still in school we didn't have money you know so i don't i even that also i i i disagree la when people every time put the blame on epl i think it's a lot to do with the fact that uh, you know when financial crisis happen you know it really affected people's life maybe that time you know a lot of things had to take a back seat yeah. people had to tighten their belts and you know football just happened to be one of it and mm-hmm. this this was also the year where simultaneously we had the world cup everybody was going through the world cup fever and then just after the world cup we had the commonwealth games that's like that ah, yes, was yes, another yes. that was that. another yeah. fever by itself and by the time yeah, all yeah, this was yeah, over yeah. i think la- oh, ma- not, largely people don't remember that actually what happened in the 1998 tiger cup if you ask any people yes. today what happened uh, nobody could recall what happened how bad uh, it was uh, how forgotten yeah. it, it, but it would but yeah. from the singapore side i can remember but i will add something though because malaysia in i think sent and sent a very unusual squad to the tiger cup yeah it was yeah. a squad of it's like it was it was unusual that malaysia would send an experimental under 21 or under 23 squad because when singapore played malaysia in that first game it felt unusual mm. like yeah singapore was so in control like the goals were coming It's just yeah. that we were not going out to wall up anyone, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a knock. It was the knock-on effect from '97 because so once that the the well, you because '90s got- once the youth cup team disappointed, once the senior team disappointed in the sea games, you know they oh, sh- FAM took a very extreme measure by dismantling, disbanding the whole team, and, and you know, I mean, foreign players were still. Available in '98, they were still there. You, I think Pinang had this player called Merzagua Mer- Abdul Raza. Yeah, I correct. think he became the best player in the league, and I think Pinang surprised everyone. They won. Yeah, yeah. Pinang won the league title. Pinang won the league title that year. That was a big surprise. So you, we could see that there, there was Azman a change Adnan of fight. Playing there. for Pinang, right? Not yet. He was still playing in Slano, oh, but the fo- but the following year, '99, because of the the, the ban on import players. Uh, Pinang could not retain their, their I think Mirzago Abdel Raza was one of them I can't remember there was another player one Brazilian player so they had to look for local stars so mm. Azmanan was brought in okay and so that Pinang team what what do you recall about them I have to be honest I can't recall that much about them but I know for a fact that they even when they won the premier the league itself it took everyone by most of us by surprise See, because only- up to that point Up to that point, we did not see them as a team that is going to, you know, shake things up. Hmm. The most maybe we can expect them, maybe they qualify for Malaysia Cup or finish mid table. But to win the league, wow! I mean, we need you need to get some Penang fans, some oh, long time Penang fans, to come into your show and ask them a drill yeah. deep, deeper to see what what was the story behind <laughs> it. Because the yeah, only I remember from the Penang victory when I saw on TV because RTM was still available in Singapore. I remember the then Penang Chief Minister coming on to pitch side to celebrate. That was oh, yeah. the only thing I remember. Yeah, that's the only thing I remember. And along I, with I the foreigner you mentioned, along with the foreigner. And um, Slango got relegated. Was that a big shock? Yeah, it is a big shock. I mean, um, who would have expected after yeah. all the the respites they have created in the years before that to suddenly get relegated? Yeah. I mean, it was. Quite, quite surprisingly, what, what happened? I'm not too sure exactly what's the reason, but I think it has probably have to do with the um, uh, the, the the patron who was holding the Slango team at that time, the Menteri Besar. Um, mm. I need time, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know whether is it because he stepped down and there was no kind of proper support for that Slango team to continue, and coupled with the fact that you know it's the economic crisis at that time. I don't. I don't think uh, you know money can be spent on uh, beefing up a football team, signing big names, big stars, and all that to come. Especially mm. when even the attendance were also dwindling as well. Oh, okay. And uh, okay, just going back to the Penang team, I've got the squad here with me. I mean, the I've managed to find the squad. There's a player called Bala Konde. Oh yeah, Bala, Bala Mandu Konde is it? Yeah, he later played uh, just... Singapore. 
Yeah, yeah Bala Conde was playing for them. There's a player called Moi Kok Hong. Mm, Chinese yeah. player. Yeah. I think all-time so, veteran player. Yeah, there, these are players that I recognize from uh, looking at the squad. The Brazilian guy, I can't, can't really find his name though. Zahidi Shoib. There's one Zahidi Shoib. I think he's probably Iranian. Yeah, so that was a Penang team. I mean, whoever is listening to this, you're a Penang fan, big fan coming from that era. Let us know, share your thoughts. We would love to hear from you. We would love to feature you as well. So let us know about that Penang team. So, I, I think we, we, I mean, we did mention about Perak earlier, right? I think 97 was the year that Perak were emerging as a new force in Malaysian football because they won the Malaysia Cup that year, beating mm. Trungano in the final. It's, it's mm. one of the rare occasions that suddenly we, we managed to see a, a capacity crowd in a, a local game. And I think it was the first final to be held in the Bukit Jalil National Stadium. And it was a good mm. turnout for, for the fans. Although the final was not very memorable because I think it went to penalty shootout, but you know, uh, Perak won. I think you know it sort of kicked out of uh, kicked off a new era for Perak football that will go into the new millennium, and yeah. also for Trungano as well. I think Trungano was also beginning to become a force in the game, and mm. the coach of Trungano at that time, I think uh, he is. I think it was Abdul Rahman Ibrahim, who later on will take up the national team role. He was the assistant coach to Carl Hein Wagen for the 1980 Olympics team. Okay. So that's interesting facts shared by Steven here. So we started off here and then as the years gone by, <laughs> I think we've just dwindled the... I wouldn't say the... As the respect for the league has gone down. It just feels like the interest has gone down over the years. Um, we're talking about 90s here. From the start of the 90s to... The near the end of the 90s and I mean as you mentioned uh, probably with various factors around it we'll speak about the national team in a different episode now next episode um, and uh, but for the league I think how would you sum up this era for Malaysian football Malaysian the Malaysian league Steven for me it was exciting it was colorful it was you know a splendid time uh, I know for a fact that um, a lot of people might I argue for many other reasons, you know, how, why the football today is much better. Maybe in terms mm. of the quality of the game on the field, because the players today are more conditioned the way they play the game. Yeah, maybe you could argue it's much better. But back then, the fanfare, you know, the unexpected twists, you know, the fact that you had so many different teams, you know, you, you couldn't figure out one specific team that is a force in the game. There's so many teams. As you can see from the the winners of the Premier League, the winners of the Malaysia Cup and the FA Cup, are all different different teams. So mm. you know, it, it speaks course, volume yeah. about yeah, it speaks of volume about the the competitiveness, competitiveness of, the, of the league, yeah, of, of the league of that era. Uh, of course, you know that's the that's the, the 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 bright side. On the dark side, of course, you know it was also the beginning of things where it was all going wrong for Malaysian football. Not that mm -hmm. it was going right all the time, but I think this is where, you know, eyes are beginning to open even wider when you have uh, foreign football available and you're seeing the quality, the stock in contrast. And, you know, you are uh, every time reading the, the papers or the, the, the football authorities not taking the proactive measures to do something to improve, keep hanging on to their job, keep coming up with one excuse after another, being too politically involved and all that. You know, it, it definitely had a profound effect on a lot of fans, lah, you know. The fact that, you know, even till today, we are still arguing about, you know, why people prefer overseas football than local football and why yeah, for the yeah. fact that uh, yeah. football, you know, we still can't get that kind of crowd again back to the stadium. It's like suddenly a generation of fans just wiped out, just disappeared. You know, even I'm trying to figure out what, what happened to them. Why suddenly out of nowhere, people who used to make it a, a regular point to go and watch game suddenly decided not to go at all. Like they went disappeared. Hmm. And it's been quite difficult for a lot of teams to pick up the pieces. But, you know, I can only hope that, you know, that those days will come back. I, you know, that's the only thing I can say. Ignori, any last words? Actually, I want to add something where I forgot to mention earlier, but I thought about it while the session was going on. Hastim hmm. Harun was the one player who actually stayed in Malaysia after Singapore exited the Malaysia Cup. He carried on playing hmm. for Johor from yeah. 93 
until 97. He returned to Balestia Central in 1998. And mm. since then, he has been there, very quiet, although on occasion, a few members of parliament and those who, those few who still recognize Hasnim, they will take photos with him, but he's largely very quiet. He's not active in coaching or in football administration. Football yeah. administration. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, it's a good is, point. Good, uh, good potential guess for us. <laughs> and actually, the thing is also this. Embu Embu did so well at Perlis, but when he came to Singapore, he ended up spending more time stocking up all the electronic products to send back to Cameroon than playing <laughs> on our pitch. True. True. That's what Richard Wood told me. Richard there was Wood another There was another also ex-World Cup star who came to Perlis after Emil Bobo. Mm. Who? Uh? Also from Cameroon? No. In fact, he also went on to manage his country at the World Cup. Ooh. Not Rigobert Song. Question. No, no, no. no, no, Ooh, no. Ah. Stefan Keshi. What year? Oh, Nigeria, yeah. Who? Stefan, Stefan Keshi. Keshi. Yeah. Oh, okay. Which year though? Which year did he play for Police? I, I think he came 97. Okay. I right. think by 97, he pretty much already was at the end of his career. I think even 94... USA 94 is one of the elder statesmen of the team. So mm. yeah, he actually played about a season here. Um, then after that, I, I'm not too sure whether he retired. But uh, in 2014, he was on the sideline for Nigeria mm. against Argentina. So when I was yeah. seeing him on the sideline, you know, it felt a bit, uh, there was nostalgic. a bit of a nostalgic feeling, like, you know. And once again, you know, I think that the question will always ask, you see, you know, uh, what? See, uh, uh, we always argue uh, what is our Malaysian players all are doing and the fellow can come, can play in Malaysia and end up coaching a team at the World Cup. Because this yeah. was the same question was raised when Claude Leroy turned up as one of the 32 head coaches in France 98. Correct. It's like we always point the blame on him. He couldn't do much for Malaysian football but he ended up yeah. coaching Cameroon at the World Cup. So, who is the problem here now? You know, those, yes. those discussions and, always turns out. And the thing is, Leroy not only coached just one World Cup, he coached in Another World Cup after that as well. I think 2002 as well. Yeah. No. Oh, okay, I think okay. after 2002. Claude Leroy. He, yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't for... Uh, wasn't for Nigeria. Sorry, it wasn't for Cameroon. Not sure which country he coached. But I think it was 2002 or something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. But the yep. black mark for Claude Leroy, Malaysia. <laughs> In his... Uh, but it's not his his career. <laughs> because that one unique incident involving Leroy was in the pre-Olympic qualifying between Singapore and Malaysia in 95. What he did was he put in one player as a sub. A few minutes later, that poor player who got sub in got sub out at the <laughs> national stadium. He was for Ghana, I think. He was a manager for Ghana. Hmm. 2006 World ah. Cup. Yep, that's that. That's uh, Club Roy second World Cup appearance. I mean, let me ask you guys. I mean, the fact that once Singapore pulled out, that's when it coincided with the S League. I mean, how would you describe the 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 the, the football scene at that time in Singapore? Actually, because I happened? think I mean, I mean, just 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 to, just to hold on, I let you go before I let you go, Gary. I mean, at that time, honestly, the internet was not really as prominent as today. So information, even though we are neighboring countries. The information exchange is almost like it never happened at all. Like we don't even know what was going on with you guys in Singapore. Yeah, I think yeah. it took me almost uh, two years to finally watch again all those players in the '96 Tiger Cup. Mm. Mm. After, after two years, only I finally I'm, get, I'm beginning to see Fundy and all the other players because mm. for two yeah. years, blank zero. I can't even. I I never even see them once or so. So maybe yeah, maybe you guys can share a bit. Okay, '96 was the start of the S League. Yep, correct. But beforehand, in between 1995, what happened after when Singapore exited the Malaysia Cup was, ironically, ABBA stayed behind to help Singapore play in that Philips International Tournament, which included a Swedish club, Austers, a Korean team, Estegal of Iran, and the Singapore Pre-Olympic team, plus one more Thailand, Thailand national team. Then mm. after that, all the players in that squad, by then ABBA is out, you end up being the first national team to play in your own premier, local league, the Premier League. So they went and wall up every team 
including one away game against Darwin Cups. But they had a spectacular 2-2 draw with Geelang International at the National Stadium. But football support locally had dwindled a lot. The headline mm-hmm. act in 1995 was when 4,000 turned up to watch, uh, you can say, the second tier game involving Wellington FC because they signed Sudra Muti. 4,000 turned up to see a second division game just because of Sudra. Serious. Hmm. Others? Yeah, but it picked up again after that in 96 oh. when S League came about. Okay. Because in 96, what happened was FS decided on policy where you can have a maximum of three national players per squad. So depending on the allocation, of course, the rule doesn't apply to Fundy. Fundy is allowed to sign for any club he wants and he has a, he's the only player with an unlimited salary cap then. All the rest have to wow. adhere to the salary cap. So he was like a marquee signing for the league. Super marquee. Mm. That time he chose Geelang in the United, which was the new name for Champions. Geelang International. Although for one time somebody once suggested behind the scenes to change it to Badog United. <laughs> Imagine oh, oh if that goodness. had been called Badog United. <laughs> but coming back also, 96 kick off with a bang because your government, the government was involved in it, was invested in it. You got your top C, one of the leading CEOs, the late Kwek Ling Ju a leading businessman to be in charge of running the league with Patrick Ang. Douglas Moore became the CEO. So there were a lot of ideas, a lot of governmental support. And of course, when you got all these national players playing in your backyard, your Bandung Stadium, your Yishun Stadium, your old Tampani Stadium, your old Jalan Besar and all these things, crowds were coming to see their heroes. Crowds were coming mm, yeah. in because it was a very new thing. And suddenly when you got Malaysia Cup stars that you see in 94 coming, like your Irvin Boban for Woodlands or... Mm. Tibor's husband Billy for Bone. Tiong, yeah, Billy Bone for Sabawang at first, yeah. Hmm. That's when you know that the S League indirectly take the thunder away from the M League. Hmm. Quite a lot of thunder. Okay, okay. And also they had the Iranian players that went on to play oh, the, the World two. Cup. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Muhammad Kapoor, Kapo, Hamid Reza, Estili. Hamid Reza, then later, Estili. Then later ninety seven. Yeah, the Thai Celeste. players as well. Oh, the Thai players began from ninety seven, ninety eight, but. Another Iranian player who played in the World Cup signed for Balestin in 1997. Ali Reza, Mansouri. Right. Yeah, yeah. The Thai yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's another thing that was mind-blowing. And I was you know, one of the things I like to do is uh, look at the squad players in every World Cup. And for some mm. reason, I'm just curious to where, which club they play for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, and same. I, and somehow or other, you know, when you look at the list of clubs, you always look at the flag because the flag is the one that tells you where who probably gives you an idea like who are the best players in the team because if, if the flag mm-hmm. is not the country's flag it means they're playing somewhere and that yeah. gives you an idea like oh, they must be the, be- the, the, be- the best place in the team and it turns out when I look at yeah. the Iranian squad there's a few Singaporean flag I'm thinking to myself <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> uh, printing, printing error or what? Uh? <laughs> no, there was no printing error it's just that probably it was very cheap and affordable to get those players this, this was down to Abu Fazl whom I had a good fortune mm. to be him in the 07 Asian Cup when he was helping out for Iran in KL. He was the one who helped me get the interview with Bahid Hashiman when I couldn't get Ali Karimi and no thanks to the media officer. Mm. Abu Fazl was the one who got the two Iranians plus Jalal Talebi to Geelang United in 1996. Jalal Talebi, yes. yes. So you got the international flavor shifting a bit towards Singapore. Although in terms of market signing, Singapore never did anything. Mbu was a big failure. I mean, <laughs> we talk about the electronic stuff. So, <laughs> the less say on that, the better. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. So, we, actually, uh, good point you raised there, Steven. Because after these two episodes with Bola Bola Show, we're going to have a S S-League show where we're going to mm. feature the teams that are now no longer in S S-League. Oh, okay. So, look out for that episode as well yep. coming out probably about two, three weeks' time. Yeah. Okay. So... Yeah, that brings the end of uh, this interesting, nostalgic episode on M League in the 90s. I think brought back a lot of memories. And al- although at a certain point, of course, we, those of us in Singapore, we got detached. And as like what Steven has said, you know, the exchange of information wasn't as uh, rapid as it is today. So that's probably a reason why we also lost track about what's happening in uh, Malaysian football as well. But, you know, Steven kept us abreast today with... Uh, all that's happened over the years and uh yeah so it's been good fun thanks a lot for the time 
sharing uh, this episode as well uh, gary thanks for coming on the episode Thank siva you, thanks for the idea first of all no nah, no problem man i mean uh, it's anything that works down memory lane is always good for the heart as you yeah. come to a certain age lah correct of course <laughs> of course <laughs> Okay guys uh, it's me Rasani of Chow All right bye bye